Good morning, everyone, and and welcome to our service uh, this morning. I'd like to. Uh, I don't think we see any new visitors uh, with us today, but uh, we welcome you all. Uh, I'd like to just a, f a few things to remind you of. First of all, this is the uh, our sweet hour of prayer and on Wednesday at 1:30, and you're all welcome to attend. And also, uh, uh, those of you that haven't uh, requested the Lenten uh, reflections, uh, could you please uh, see Graham to be included on the Lenten reflection? Uh, uh, I started to uh, read them, and they're very um, uh, comforting and challenging with the, because there's uh, three little questions to challenge you at the end of them. So. Uh, I could recommend them to you. Uh, next Sunday, Graham will be continuing his uh, series on one another. And uh, with that, I'll hand over to Graham. Thank you, Keith, especially for the unsolicited uh, invitation or encouragement to, uh, to get the... Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer Lenten Reflections on. Very grateful for uh, those of you who are on that list and uh, trust you will enjoy those, those as Keith has, has already begun to do. We're going to sing to start with and the hymn is 471, Seek Ye First the Kingdom of God. Three verses. be seated. And shall we come with our prayer of invocation? We've just said, knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're knocking and praying that you would open to us this morning something of your glory, something of the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask that as we come, you will help us to grow in our understanding and uh, in our obedience might we find our hearts strangely warmed to walk in the steps of Jesus. Uh, it is hard for us and you've given us a helper and so may your Holy Spirit lead and guide us in this hour. Accept our worship and unite us with Christian people everywhere who seek to exalt the Lord Jesus and to walk in his steps. We ask it for his glory. Amen. Christine is going to bring us young at heart. Good morning. Um, it's nice to have an excuse to take off my mask. Um, so yes, the topic is mentor and mentee. I found it hard to find a title, though the topic came to me suddenly, as it sometimes does. I think I, I think... I certainly hope that everyone in Melbourne and probably everyone in Australia is aware 
that we are coming to the end of the two weeks of the Australian Open. Now, I know views were very mixed on whether this should go ahead, but it's gone ahead. And to date, as far as we know, no one caught COVID through it. So hopefully that's going to be the case. Anyway, many people across the world are watching. And they're watching because they enjoy tennis, but also because if we in Melbourne, you know, the royal we, if we in Melbourne can host such an international event safely, then other countries are hoping this means they can too, including, I've been told, the Olympics. But that's a very different story. So we have very dear friends in Germany. They are actually the parents-in-law of our youngest daughter. And we went with them and Sarah and Henrik and their families to the Open last year. I'd been twice before when I'd been gifted a ticket, but last year we paid our own way. We loved it. We loved the whole atmosphere and I said to Graham, as long as our health lasts, we should try to come for one day a year. Well, guess what that brought on? So we're not going this year. Our German friends, Frieda and Sabina, they've been watching. Sabina actually plays tennis, so she is much more into tennis than I am. And so we're texting sort of, when we're both out of bed at the same time, about who did what and who said what, and so on. I tend to dip in and out of watching. I like to keep abreast of the personalities, the scores, and how individuals respond in success and in defeat. And I try always to listen to the speeches at the end of the finals. So far this year, the most moving moment for me was when Serena Williams and Naomi Osaka approached one another after Naomi, who I thought was 29, but she's only 23. Serena's 39 and we kept wondering how much longer she'd go. She lost to Naomi Osaka in the semi-finals. If you saw that moment, Naomi Osaka, who, as I understand it, she was born in Japan but went to America when she was three, but still talks of herself as Japanese. As she walked, she and um, Serena approached one another, three times Naomi went and gave that sort of head bow of respect. And then when they embraced, I noticed that three times Serena tapped Naomi on the back the way we have all done to someone we care about. Often we do it when we're consoling. But I felt it was a very, that it was, you know, a, spic a picture is worth a thousand words. What lay behind this? Well, Osaka grew up, or so Naomi, we call them by second names, Osaka grew up adoring Williams and used her as a model when she was playing. I realize I'm not looking at the pictures at all, but hopefully Graham is keeping them going. Serena knows this, and I thought, if you have to lose, what better way to lose than to someone who learned from you? So this that moment for me was beautiful. 
and I thought of how important good role models are. Yes, in sport, but even more in how we live our lives. Now, in 2015, I turned 70, and I found myself thinking a lot about the people who have mentored me and whose example I strive to follow. And actually, I think it was the following year we made special trips to thank two of them, one in France, one in Germany. They're both still alive in their 90s. The one in France is 98. And I talk to her about once every month. Anyway, who am I grateful to? They range from relatives through teachers at day school and at Sunday school, at Girl Guides. And I know Graham somewhere found this photograph of me. I think I unearthed it in 2015. And, of course, I've got it down here, but it's easier to see here. If you notice, I'm the young thing on the left. Those four women are all smiling at me. And I thought when I looked, how much did you care about this 15-year-old? I had just earned my Queen's Guide and the first person in my company to do so. So they were incredibly proud of me, but it was much more than pride. It was that affirming kind of love and appreciation that only comes from people who care. So, for the young and younger ones here, I think Tristan's our only really young one today, choose wisely whose example you follow. Naomi will always be glad she watched Serena play. But for the rest of us, let's strive to be good, good examples to others. And whatever age we are, be willing to mentor those who cross our paths. I know when I stopped teaching, I thought, well, apart from my own children and grandchildren, that's it for my involvement with young people. But no, it wasn't. Other people, without me seeking, come into my life. Above all, of course, we want to follow Christ's example. For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Christ is our example. May we all follow in his steps. Thank you. Loris is going to bring us our Bible reading this morning. Thank you, Loris. The reading this morning is from the Philippians, chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. Oh. I forgot my glasses actually. Um, they're just in my in my purse there, in the white one. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good. Thank you. So Philippians, chapter two, verses one to eleven. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with his spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, 
but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of the ser servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Thank you, Loris. Your free will offering will now be received. Lord, for the privilege of sharing in the work of your kingdom, we give thanks. And ask that you'd receive these offerings, that they might honour the name of the Lord Jesus, and we ourselves might be counted among his servants. Amen. The hymn is number 67 from the Revised Church Hymnary, Thou didst leave thy throne. You'll see the uh, words sit very comfortably with the passage that Loris has just read to us.
Well, you can find anything on the internet, I'm sure. This is something I never expected to find, and it's the image that I've used on the cover of our leaflet for today. At least I used a fraction of it on the cover. It picks up the alelone word in the New Testament, and I've told you that there are 100 times that this word occurs in the New Testament. And the, the image picks them up and, and marks them out for us. We've dealt with several of them. We began in some weeks ago now in John's Gospel, chapter 13, with Jesus washing his disciples' feet and inviting us to serve one another. And later on in chapter 15, to love one another. So we've thought about that. And that's there on the front of this sheet. And there are many others. Uh, but they fall into certain categories. We've dealt with speaking the truth to one another. And uh, we're going to turn today to think about being like-minded with one another. How, is this, how does this work out? Well, there are certain things that uh, I've gathered together from several passages in the New Testament that talk about our minds as Christian people. Um, some years ago, and I've mentioned this book before, some years ago, I think it was 1965, I bought this book. It's called The Christian Mind. And it's written by a man, and I've, since 1965, thought of him as Harry Blamires. But I found out that, in fact, he's, he, uh, he was still alive and giving talks in 2001. And he was introduced at, a, at Keswick as Harry Blamires. So I'm trying to get my head around the idea that this man that I've always thought of as Blamires is <laughs> Blamires. But he, is, uh, he was a student of C.S. Lewis at Oxford University. And C.S. Lewis encouraged him to write. And he became a head of uh, English department uh, at a college that, which later became a university. But his thesis in this book is that Christians were drawing back from expressing their a Christian perspective in public debate. And they were just making it a personal matter about how they feel. And so he was concerned that the Christian vision of what we should be as Christians was shrinking. He was con concer concerned that, that the faith would become just a private thing, merely about personal matters and merely even about our feelings. So what he is saying to us is challenging us to think about our Christian minds not just in the private uh, realm, but also in the, public, in the public sphere. And I'll come back to that a little bit, perhaps. So the categories, the headings I've used to try and uh, get around this topic for us this morning are, first of all, the Bible and your mind. We have to think about what the Bible says about our minds. I want to think about the pressures to social conformity. That is, to shape our thinking in other ways. And then I want to think about the mind of our master. If we call Jesus Lord, how does that show? And then I want to talk about a mind transformed and renewed. So these are the categories. And uh, let's, before we, we move forward, let us just uh, pray that God would use these uh, reflections to uh, draw us all closer to him. Lord, we ask that the words of my mouth... And the meditations of our heart in this hour will be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Okay, first of all then, the Bible and your mind. Numerous verses throughout the New Testament refer to the mind of Christian people. Perhaps the most obvious one is uh, when, when uh, Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment of all? And I'm sure we all know it. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. There it is. With all your mind and with all your strength. And what was he doing? He was quoting from the Old Testament. He was quoting from a daily Jewish prayer. Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's called the Shema. 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And as if that wasn't enough, it went on to say that they should write these commandments on their foreheads and on their hands and on the doorposts of their houses and on their gates. And if you've got Jewish friends, and Christian and I have, when we go to that house, there's a little mezuzah on the doorpost and it contains a Hebrew, little Hebrew inscription from the Old Testament. Just a reminder that this is a house that pays attention to the word of God, to the Hebrew scriptures. So people usually touch it as they enter. And you've seen Jewish people praying at the Wailing Wall with a phylacteries on their forehead, little leather box, and leather boxes on the back of their hands. We would say as Protestant Christians that the command in the Old Testament, which has been taken literally, was meant to be taken figuratively. So what the box on the forehead was meant to symbolize the mind being dominated by the word of God. And the word on the hands was meant to signify your work being the work of God. But uh, obviously some people take it very literally and, and we uh, don't uh, ridicule that as long as the implication of it carries right through. So Jesus accepted that God was revealed in the Hebrew scriptures. He was there and uh, the, uh, recognized their authority. Now, I've said once before here that in uh, 1648, it's quite a long time ago now, the Westminster Shorter Catechism was drafted. And this was the catechism that I grew up with. And the 22nd question was, how did Christ, being the Son of God, become man? And the answer that the framers of the confession came up with, and this is, I never learned the 107 questions, I have to say, and answers. I only learned about 43. I think that was when I stopped learning. But the answer to this one was one I knew. Christ, the Son of God, became man by taking to himself a true body and a reasonable soul and being conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary and born of her, yet without sin. So these are a collection of statements that the New Testament tells us and that are brought together here by these framers of the Confession and the Westminster Shorter Catechism in 1648. And the, the verse I want to pick out is this reasonable soul. It doesn't mean it was pretty average soul. What it means is it was a soul with the ability to reason. Jesus had a true body. That is, if you pricked him, he bled blood. If he worked hard, he sweated sweat. He got hungry. He got tired. He needed sleep. All of those things that are true of you and me because we have bodies, indeed we are bodies, those things were true of Jesus. And it's also true that he took uh, a mind that could think, a reasonable mind, a thinking mind, as most people have, the ability to think and reason. And so the Bible is telling us that the mind of Christ was like our minds. He learned the way we do. We can't evade the fact that the Christian message is about revelation. We didn't think it up from the ground up. It came from God to us. It was revealed. It was revealed to Abraham and Moses and David. And the revelation unfolded as these Old Testament people struggled with their understanding of an unseen God in a world that was full of gods you could handle and touch. So Jesus is primarily known to us, to you and to me, through the writings of the New Testament. And the Protestant Bible contains the Old Testament, which Jesus used. It's actually the, the Protestant Bible is, in fact, those books which the Jewish scholars translated from Hebrew into Greek 200 years before Christ's birth. Now, the Catholic Bible is different, and it includes additional books which were written subsequent to that. But our Protestant Bible leaves those out, although the uh, framers of the Westminster Confession in 1848, 1648 uh, said that these were valuable books and worth reading. So here we have our Protestant Bible 
And the New Testament is that, that which was written by the apostles or close associates of the apostles and has been received by the church. And from time to time there's a bit of arguing about this book or that book. But we have our Bibles and we have to, th to read them and think about them. And as Jesus believed the revelation of God in the Hebrew Scriptures, so Christians in the New Testament have received God's revelation of himself, especially in the person of Jesus, as the Word made flesh. The Word is written for us, but it speaks about the Word made flesh, a person whom we worship. I heard an old song this week by... Uh, it was written by Paul Simon. Some of you might have remember Simon and Garfunkel. Well, Art Garfunkel was singing this song called Kathy's Song. And it was uh, made clear to me decades ago when somebody heard this song first. He said, there's a truth there but a terrible error as well. And in this song, it's a love song. Like half the world's songs are love songs. In this song... Uh, Art Garfunkel sings, So you see I've come to doubt All that I once held as true I stand alone without beliefs The only truth I know is you And the person who was speaking to me said The truth is personal That's correct The truth comes down to a person But it's not Kathy Like Art Garfunkel, like Paul Simon the Cathy that Paul Simon was so influenced by when there were buskers in London, because that's what it's about. They all need to be for, come before the truth as it is in Jesus. He's the true person that we must emulate and become like. And to do that, we need the mind of Christ. And in the leaflet which uh, you've got today, I've listed five passages... Uh, at the end of the first point, five passages. You can download these from the website uh, or you can take home a copy today. Um, uh, five passages which speak about being of one mind. Romans 12 and 14, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 2 Corinthians 13, Philippians 2, which Loris read to us, and 1 Peter chapter 3. So they all exhort us to have this distinctive mind of Christ. And two things stand out about it. It's aware of social pressures and the change of mind we need. Let's think about those pressures. Let's think about why C.S. Lewis encouraged Harry Blumiers to write about the Christian mind. In fact, if you want to listen to uh, this man speaking, he lived to be over 100, I discovered, uh, if you want to listen to him, you can find him at this website. You don't have to write it down. If you go to it, it's, it's in the uh, leaflet for today. I've decided to put a reference to it there if you're on the internet at home. Or if you download this form from the website when Ken puts it there, you should just have to click on it and it will open that page. And that page is not a statement. It's an audio track of Harry Blamir speaking in Keswick in 2001. And in, in that talk, he's talking about the post-Christian mind. He's saying there's so much we've lost since the 60s. So it's quite a revelation just to, to hear him speak. He's a man who carefully assesses words. So, so the question is the pressure to social conformity. Well, our worship of God, what we do as we come together like this, and what we do when we go out in the world and do our jobs and our work and relate in our families, all of that is our worship. It's our service to God. It's like we come and we bow down and then we go away and we serve him. The commandments talk about that, remember? He talks about false gods. You shall not bow down to them nor go away and serve them. We are to bow down to the one, the one true God who's revealed in Jesus, we're to adore that person. And then we're to go into our everyday lives and be people who recommend him by our lives and by our words. But there is a danger, and the danger is uh, con contained 
so powerfully in a simple statement at the end of John's first letter. Remember he says, after talking about other things, about suddenly out of the blue he seems to say, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Idolatry is so real. I, I've been reading a book called Wild Swans. And in it, the author is talking about being a teenager at the same time as this book was written. And, and as she grew up in the 60s in China, there was this frenzied euphoria about Chairman Mao. And young people basically were devoted to him as if he were God. And she talks quite openly about uh, their adoration and worship of Chairman Mao. And everything was for him. And, and terrible things were done at that time. Which uh, China probably has, has been scarred by. Um, so, so it's possible that you and I, our children... Uh, that a whole people can be misled to worship the wrong God. And, and it might be subtle. It might not be... You would say, how can people do that? If you've seen people cheering the supreme leader of North Korea, you will become aware that a whole population can be misled. So how do we do it? Well, first of all, we need to recognize that Jesus himself was tempted. The beginning of Matthew and Luke both tell us being tempted. Uh, he was tempted, in a sense, by the world, the flesh, and the devil. The word diabolos for devil means a liar. And temptation comes as, as a package of lies that seems one thing, but is in fact another. So this was presented to Jesus, you remember. He was hungry, and he was being tempted to satisfy himself with turning a stone into bread. But his mission was not to satisfy himself. That wasn't why he came. He came for you and for me. He came to redeem us. And if he had put priority on satisfying his own needs using powers that you and I don't have, then he would be short-circuiting the whole enterprise. And then, of course, he's given the option of making all the nations of the earth his, if he just falls down and worships the devil. They would all be cheering him, the way the crowds in North Korea cheer Kim Jong, whichever Kim Jong it is. Um, so, but he doesn't do that. And then finally he's taken to the temple, to the holiest place. And the temptation is throw yourself down and surely God's angels will pick you up. So he's to challenge God's mission here by uh, seeking God's protection for his life. But he didn't come to protect himself. He came to step into a place of danger for you and me. So how do we get the mind of God for us? We, Like Jesus, we need to turn to God's revelation in Scripture. The distinctive mind we need is the mind of our Master. And the powerful pressures that were exerted on Jesus uh, apply to us as well. We are daily uh, pressured to pursue our own interests, to put ourselves first, to not be bothered about others. Like Jesus' disciples, we want the top spots in the kingdom. Lord, when you come in your kingdom, I want to be at your right-hand side. Well, at least notice me and maybe give me a place above others. We have to learn how to serve and that doesn't come naturally. We used to teach children a little hymn, which, a little chorus about joy. And it was about Jesus first, others next, and yourself last of all. J-O-Y. And that's... Uh, that's simple, right? Not. How do we put ourselves last of all? And that's before we remember that Jesus himself said in the Sermon on the Mount, love your enemies. 
Do good to those who despitefully use you. In so doing, you will become the children of your heavenly Father. How far short do we fall? Well, here, as in all things, we need forgiveness. Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are, but he didn't sin, says the letter to the Hebrews. That means that he felt the force of the temptation more than we ever do, because somewhere along that trajectory, we capitulate and we give in and we say, all right, it's time now for me to look after number one. And by that, we usually mean ourselves. Jesus embraced the role of the servant. He took the towel. He stepped down. While we were his enemies, he loved us. Will we turn from this Jesus to serve idols or embrace the call, his call, to love and serve others? To do this is to have our thinking challenged and our minds transformed. Do we want that transformation? Do we want our minds changed? Do we see changing your mind as a weakness? We sometimes do. I once had someone speak at, Co at Scotch College in assembly and said, no, you didn't hear me, he said. I changed my mind. Think about what it means to change your mind. To be open to growth in ways you didn't expect as you read the scripture and attend to the Spirit's voice in your life. So we're thinking then about a mind transformed and renewed and I couldn't do this any better than using the words of one of the commentaries on Romans, which I, I have. Um, this is a man called uh, Charles Cranfield, C.E.B. Cranfield, wrote a lovely commentary on the Romans. And this is what he says when he comes to chapter 12. He says, the Christian has always to confess that to a painfully large extent, his life is conformed to this age. Instead of going on contentedly and complacently, allowing himself to be stamped afresh and molded by the fashion of this world, he is now to yield himself to a different pressure, to the direction of the Spirit of God. Yield yourself to this pressure. This is what Paul is saying in Romans 12, 1 and 2. It is as the Holy Spirit renews the fallen mind, loosening the, bo the bonds of egocentricity, so that it begins to think truly objectively instead of egocentrically, that a person's whole life is transformed. Whole life. Do you just want Sunday mornings transformed? Well, that's easy. Do you just want uh, a quiet moment of the day to reflect and have that a transforming moment? Or would you want all of your life to be changed? Is it a 24-7 thing? Is it something that's happening to you minute by minute? We need then to, to ask ourselves, are our minds being subjected to the Word of God? I think the Lenten readings which Keith referred to uh, one of the reasons I had thinking that this would be good would be because Bonhoeffer was writing at a time when there were enormous external forces. The Nazi regime was putting colossal pressure on the churches and on everybody to conform to a certain image. And Bonhoeffer is resisting that as a Bible-reading Christian person. He doesn't want to be pressed into that mold. How is he resisting? Where did he get his strength from? So we need to ask ourselves, what pressures do we live with? From the advertisers? From uh, uh, our peer group? The people we are friendly with and circulate with daily? What role does the media or even social media play? Are we able to discuss such things as the questions, for example, in the Bonhoeffer Reflections invite? Do we have habits of reading and meditation and singing and prayer and fellowship that help us develop a Christian way of thinking, a Christian mind? Do we limit our Christian thinking to spiritual matters 
Or do we see them having profound social implications? Do we limit our prayers at our family circle? Or do we get carried out into the world beyond? Do we feel its pain like Jesus did? Are we concerned for its healing? Do our prayers have a global reach? Are we concerned not just with our own personal spiritual enrichment, but also to contribute to public conversation and the welfare of our society? If we do, we seek nothing less than a kind of society that is formed in the mind of Christ and which will one day come upon us when he comes to us and invites us to his side to share his glory and to reign in a world that is unimaginably glorious where truth and righteousness flourish and diabolos is gone forever. There is no more lie. May God bless his word to us as our minds are shaped by his word and spirit. Amen. Now I, I have uh, scripted some prayers for today and uh, I'll also allow a short moment of quietness where we can bring our prayers for loved ones from our congregation here who are not here today because of ill health and other issues and uh, because of the prevalence of uh, the need to take precautions against COVID. So shall we join our hearts and pray together? Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you humbled yourself to embrace our humanity and as a man you subjected yourself to cruel men and were rejected and died shamefully and an excruciating death your selfless mind and humble heart brought you to us concerned to secure the redemption of a lost and self-destructive humanity. We believe it was for us you hung and suffered there. It was your will to give glory to your Father in heaven by accomplishing the work he gave you to redeem us from our lostness. We confess that in so many ways the mind of our Saviour is not characteristic of us. We are so challenged by our own ego and sense of self-importance. We are lazy when it comes to reading our Bibles and reluctant to listen to one another and slow to think things through and resistant to changing our minds. Holy Spirit, please renew and remake us in the image of our Lord. Thank you that the stage four lockdown of last week seems to have achieved its circuit-breaking intention and that Christian congregations are again free to assemble today. May our worship arise as a sweet incense to you. Thank you too that in the wider public uh, we have been able to enjoy the Australian Open and there appears to have been no rise of infection on account of it. We thank you for the pleasure this has brought to many people. Thank you too that the vaccine rollout starts tomorrow in Australia. Please enable the administration to run well and without glitches to protect those most at risk and enable maximal advantage of the surplus doses. Thank you for the renewed commitment of the wealthy nations to ensure the poor receive vaccine. Might it not be in word only but transfer into actual vaccine distribution and injections to protect those who have no resources of their own. In this, we would be like you. Thank you that Aung San Suu Kyi proposed working with leaders of ethnic minorities in Myanmar. We pray for safety for the people there as they protest against the military coup and are denied the results of their election. We pray for all countries where we hear of oppression and tyranny imposed on the population, also today thinking of Eritrea and asking for prisoners of conscience in that country to be granted freedom. We're aware that domestic violence and the abuse of women and children, mostly at the hands of men they trusted, 
takes place in our country. We fear that having sown the wind, we may reap the whirlwind. We pray for all who have been harmed by abuse. Restore to us a new awareness of dignity and respect of all people, irrespective of gender, color, and creed. We pray for those we know who are troubled with ill health and uncertainty about their future, health of body and health of mind. Many of them are elderly, but some are young. Many are known to us. We lift them to you in the quiet of our hearts now. Lord, please follow with your blessing. The proclamation of your word for Jesus has been exalted today. Encourage all who bear witness to his salvation, especially where there are hostile forces seeking to mold and manipulate their minds. These things we ask in the name of our Lord and Saviour, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our hymn is the lovely hymn of Francis Ridley Haverhill. Uh, Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee.
like to say how nice it is to hear you singing. I'd like to thank Shirley at the organ. I didn't tell you before the service started. I stumbled and unintentionally, I assure you, destroyed all the settings on the, on the keyboard that were ready to go for the morning, so created some last-minute tension. So uh, let us just pray now as we step forward into the week. Lord, we ask that you'll part us with your blessing. We pray that grace, mercy, and peace from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit will rest upon and remain with each one of us and with all whom we love now and always. socially distanced and enjoy fellowship. <laughs>